Hello, people of the internet. This is Kaiju Noir here, back with a new string of kaiju-related reviews. It has been proven throughout the history of cinema that whenever a film becomes popular, there will always be imitators to follow. These imitators would try to, ahem, <clears throat> borrow whatever elements that made the original so great, and try to emulate the film with varying levels of success. The same can definitely be said for Godzilla. During the 60s, several filmmakers from around the world noticed the growing popularity of the Big G and tried their hand at creating their own monster movies. So now we will be taking a look at the movies that have been more or less inspired by everyone's favorite kaiju in chronological order, starting with the Danish film Reptilicus. The story begins in Lapland, where a team of miners accidentally find the preserved tail of a prehistoric creature. The tail is then transported to Copenhagen, Denmark in an aquarium. I really like saying it that way, where it is preserved in a freezer room in the aquarium. Professor Martins, the scientist who studies the specimen, discovers that the tail can regenerate after it was accidentally exposed to room temperature. At a press conference, Professor Martins and his colleague Dr. Dalby reveal their intentions of allowing the creature to grow and, at the suggestion of one of the reporters, decided to name it Reptilicus. Eventually, Reptilicus grows to the point where it escapes and goes on a rampage across Denmark. So now Professor Martins and his allies have to work together in order to kill Reptilicus before he destroys all of Europe. Gee, perhaps allowing a giant monster to regenerate its whole entire body wasn't such a good idea after all. You see? You see? You're stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! The story is another standard monster on the loose tail. The only twist here is that the scientists are responsible for, in a way, creating the monster. The characters are also pretty standard for this genre, but the actors do a decent job. The only character that bugged me was Peterson, the comic relief of the film. He just acts dim-witted and doesn't amount to anything in the story other than to make funny faces at the camera. What was sort of unintentionally funny was how two side characters went out and the viewer follows them as they take a tour throughout the city. Here, the plot pretty much took a backseat in order for the movie to advertise its country of origin. Music is something that I rarely cover in my reviews, but in this case, I do have to mention that in two laboratory scenes, the music becomes very suspenseful and eerie, which gives the scenes an atmosphere akin to the Universal Monster movies. Besides those two scenes, the loud, brassy music is very similar in style to the Godzilla films, minus the memorability. Finally, we come to the point that pretty much everyone came here for, the special effects. With such average story and characters, the effects will make or break the movie for you. With that said, the Reptilicus puppet looks absolutely laughable both in design and execution. The serpentine body appears very scrawny, its limbs are tiny and useless, and the addition of wings just doesn't look right. Reptilicus is not imposing at all, and doesn't have the presence that a giant monster should have. What's funny is that during the press conference scene, Professor Martins claims that Reptilicus is a dinosaur that was a descendant of the sauropods. Now how in the nine realms of Norse mythology does this descend from this. With that said, it always irks me how almost every giant reptile in movies during this time is considered a dinosaur. I'm pretty sure audiences would understand that there were other prehistoric creatures that existed alongside dinosaurs. In terms of the other special effects, they failed to make the puppet any more impressive than it already was. In fact, from my point of view, they make the film that much more fun to watch. Whenever there was a close-up of the monster, the shots were always filmed in slow motion, much like that of a Godzilla movie. However, unlike a Godzilla movie, which requires the use of a high-speed camera to make the slow motion look smooth, it seemed like regular cameras were used for Reptilicus, making every scene have choppy frame rates, especially in one hilariously bad composite shot where Reptilicus eats a man. You know how most non-Godzilla fans would think of the movies as cheap-looking monsters destroying cardboard models? Well, that is pretty much how Reptilicus looks like, as not only is the monster lackluster, but so is everything around it. Any destruction scene is embarrassing when compared to any monster flick from Japan or America at this time. It's not like they can't pull off a snake-like monster destroying a city using miniatures and puppets, because two years later, Toho, the company behind the Godzilla movies, would create Atragon, a film featuring Manda who would later go on to appear in Destroy All Monsters five years later. Both the Manda puppet and the scenes involving it worked much better. Say, wouldn't it be funny if Toho actually saw Reptilicus back in 61 and created Manda just to troll Saga Studios? 
There were several scenes present in the original Danish version of the film where Reptilicus actually used its wings, but were cut from the American version because American International Pictures, the company behind the American distribution of the film, considered them too unrealistic. What was added instead was a green slimy cartoonish acid that Reptilicus would shoot from its mouth. The effect is rarely convincing, and what's weird is how whenever there are scenes of people being covered by the acid, the acid covers the whole screen, freezes in place for about a third of a second, and then the next shot would take place. So this was considered unrealistic by American International Pictures, yet they were okay with this? Brilliant! Reptilicus is the kind of film that not everyone will enjoy. Its story and characters are nothing special, and the effects are awful even by 1960s standards. However, it's the bad effects that allowed it to still stay in people's heads after all these years. I feel that Reptilicus can be enjoyed by people like me, who enjoy watching movies that are considered so bad they're good, and can have a fun time watching Reptilicus with the right set of mind. Which is why this film deserves a 2 out of 5. So until next time everybody, take care.